God on today's Hot Zone. This is the Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. going on in Ethiopia right now, and why would you? we got enough conflict and crisis here in the United States. But there are a lot of people hurting there, and that's because there's some pretty bad fighting going on. And I just want to explain a little bit about the, the roots of this conflict and what's happening and what we can expect to see over the next couple of weeks in, in Ethiopia, because that's what we do here on the, on the Hot Zone. I try to illuminate for you the conflicts and crises around the world that you just aren't hearing much about on the news. It always just kind of bothers me that there's so many people hurting around the world and we're focused on just petty things in the United States. Uh, and so I, I want to broaden your horizons a little bit. All right, so let's talk about Ethiopia. I've been to Ethiopia several times and I can tell you it's one of the most fascinating, adventurous, uh, just mysterious countries that I've ever visited. Uh, it, it has an amazing history uh, that's tied to Christianity because there are a lot of Ethiopian Christians. They say that they, had, they descended, um, for, that they actually have the Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia. And uh, I went there and did a an investigation on that, whether or not they actually have the Ark of the Covenant. And what I can tell you is that uh, I don't know for sure if they have the actual Ark of the Covenant, but I can tell you for sure that they believe they have the Ark of the Covenant and they have believed it for a long, long time. Here's a piece I made about that. Check this out. The Ark of the Covenant, built by Moses to hold the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments at the command of God himself. In Jerusalem, it was the literal dwelling of the Most High, secreted in the darkness of the Holy of Holies for centuries. Then it disappeared. No one knows exactly where or when, but for more than 2,000 years, the whereabouts of the Ark have been shrouded in mystery, despite countless attempts to track it down. There are many theories as to the whereabouts of the Holy Relic. Some say it's buried under the Temple Mount, Others contend it was carried to Egypt before being lost to history. Wherever it may be, the lost Ark of the Covenant has become one of the most sought after Christian relics in history. On a recent trip to Africa, I met up with explorer Bob Cornhook, founder of the Bible Archaeology Search and Exploration Institute. He's been investigating a little known theory about the Ark for over 10 years and agreed to let me tag along on another fact-finding adventure. A former crime scene investigator in Los Angeles, Bob has made a name for himself by searching for biblical relics based on the same techniques he used in law enforcement. Taking the Bible as a literal guide, he's traced the route of the Jewish exodus from Egypt, searched for Noah's Ark, and probed the mystery surrounding the true location of Mount Sinai. His Ark theory goes like this. Just before the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem in 586 BC, Levitical priests moved the Ark to Egypt to save it from being destroyed. After more than a century there, it was moved again all the way up the Nile River to Lake Tana in Ethiopia. And this is where they say that they had the Ark and it rested right into where those trees are. We're gonna go by it here right now. And as we go by with the boat, you're gonna see where they actually say the Ark sat in a tent similar, uh, very similar to the tabernacle in the wilderness. The monks living on Tanakirkos Island haven't changed their worship or way of life for thousands of years. Even today, they dress in animal skins and live a primitive existence farming the small island. They also spend more than three hours a day in prayer. The monks showed us relics that they say arrived with the ark. So these implements were said to be brought with the ark from Solomon's temple. And this is the gomer that sits down, they put the blood in it, and then they would sprinkle the blood upon the ark. According to these men, their ancestors safeguarded the ark here for 800 years. In that time, Ethiopia became a Christian nation. And after that, the king came and retrieved the ark 
and took it to Aksum, where we're going next. The city of Aksum in northern Ethiopia was once the capital of the kingdom. Ancient kings built giant obelisks to mark their graves, which rival the pyramids in engineering genius. Legend has it that the Ark was brought here in about 400 AD and was placed in the church of Our Lady Mary of Zion. The only man allowed to see the Ark is a monk called the Guardian, who's never allowed to leave the church enclosure. It's like a bunker. It's made out of uh, uh, cinder blocks. And they, they tell me that as you go in that door, that there is a corridor that goes to the left. Then there's a corridor makes a sharp right turn, and then another sharp right turn, coming back to where what they claim is the Ark of the Covenant, sitting in a big stone sarcophagus box with a silver ornate inlaid sleeve. So people say, why doesn't someone go in and get it? It'd be pretty hard to bring it out because they actually built the building around this object that they call the Ark of the Covenant. We arrived in Aksum on the holiest day of the Ethiopian Orthodox calendar, the festival of Timkat. It's a day when tens of thousands of the faithful make a pilgrimage to Aksum, and a replica of the Ark is brought out of this church and paraded through the streets of the city. The people sing and dance before the procession, and the party lasts all night long. Timcat is like Easter and Christmas all wrapped into one. This is their festival of the Epiphany, their most important holiday of the year. And these women will be out here all night long, worshiping, singing songs, and praying. There's no doubt that this is a special place and a special time. The next morning, these revelers continue celebrating with songs and dances that haven't changed in millennia. It's a fascinating look into Old Testament style worship that can't be found anywhere else in the world. At the end of the day, there's no way to know for certain if the Ark is here or not. But one thing is for sure, there's no doubt whatsoever in the minds of these Ethiopian Christians. Do I personally believe it? I don't know. I believe they either have the actual Ark of the Covenant mentioned in the Bible, or they have a replica that is so convincing that they've believed it to be the Ark of the Covenant for more than 2,000 years. Chuck Holton, CBN News, Oxum, Ethiopia. Okay, now back to the conflict at hand. First of all, you have to understand that Ethiopia is one of the poorest countries on the planet, and you notice that as soon as you get there because there's just an amazing amount of... Uh, well, in the United States, when there's somebody who has a medical issue, like uh, is maybe born with a cleft lip or uh, maybe born without an arm or something like that, uh, we have lots of medical care in the United States that sort of takes care of things like that. In Ethiopia, they don't have that. And so you see lots and lots of people who are handicapped in one way or another, uh, just living on the streets, wandering around on the streets. Uh, and it's, it's actually pretty shocking and horrifying when you first uh, get there and see it. The poverty is almost beyond anything that you'd see in, in Haiti. And that's saying something. Uh, but the people there have an incredible dignity about them. They're beautiful people. And let's talk about this current crisis. So you have, uh, actually, it's, it's an ethnic or an ethno-racial conflict. It's funny that uh, people in Ethiopia would call this a racial thing when they're all black, but they don't see it that way. You have the Amhara and you have the Tigray tribes. And these guys have not liked each other for a long time. This is something we see throughout Africa, that uh, uh, tribes, it's very tribal. Uh, even though they're all the same color, they still have racial division and racial conflict and lots and lots of racism in their countries. I saw that a lot in Nigeria when I was there last year. Uh, but if, if we look at Ethiopia, Tigray is up in the kind of northwestern region and... Um, the, the Tigrayan people once ruled Ethiopia, and they don't want to be ruled by the central government in Addis Ababa, the capital. And so they've been uh, de trying to basically declare themselves a self-governing uh, federal zone of, of Ethiopia. The president of Ethiopia, who actually won a Nobel Peace Prize last year, uh, has said, nope, not going to happen, and just started bombing the crap out of the, the people in Tigray. 
And that's created a humanitarian crisis. They've had more than 40,000 people that have crossed the river now from Ethiopia into Sudan to flee. Now, let me just say something. If Sudan is your option, you know it's bad, <laughs> okay? <clears throat> because Sudan is no picnic either. And uh, these people have been just in the tens of thousands crossing the river into Sudan where there's not really anything more for them. There's just not anybody bombing them. And uh, the Tigrayan army, I guess, if you want to call it that, the forces up there uh, have been fighting back. There have been massacres on both sides. Uh, the the uh, forces of Ethiopia, the Ethiopian army, uh, bombed a uh, like a college in Tigray and wounded a bunch of uh, civilians. Uh, there have been uh, there was a massacre that was documented by Amnesty International, where at least 50 people, mostly women and children, were hacked to death with machetes. They seem to like to do that in Africa, uh, and so it's it's a bad it's a bad scene. It's a bad situation. Um, here's what some of the refugees that are fleeing had to say about it. It's genocide who attacks the Tigrayan people. It's elimination on Tigrayan people. So it is unjust, unfair thing. It's not justice, it's not fair, unfair thing. So just we need freedom. More than any food or more than camp, refuge camps, we need the freedom. We need to go to our country. So we need the freedom. The UN, the United Nations also must give some big solution on us. I leave all my property there. Uh, uh, I only can, I, I can only uh, to escape with my parents and with my family, but we, there is no, there is nothing that we brought here. Uh, only with this one clothes, we don't have any additional clothes. Uh, uh, there, there are also a lot of people who live, uh, who live, uh, who live there, who didn't, uh, who can't escape here. Uh, uh, that, uh, that's so more sad. Uh. So then, of course, we have the United Nations who's uh, calling on the global community to send aid to Ethiopia and uh, help out. They're also calling for a uh, ceasefire. Of course, we are very worried with the situation in Ethiopia, and um, particularly because uh, of uh, the dramatic humanitarian impact of what's happening. Uh, we uh, are doing everything possible. Uh, to mobilize humanitarian support for the refugees that are already in Sudan, uh, more than 20,000. And uh, uh, we have been asking for the uh, uh, full respect of international humanitarian law and also for the opening of humanitarian corridors and the truces that might be necessary for humanitarian aid to be delivered uh, in the areas of conflict. So this is a matter of enormous concern to us, and I hope that uh, um, uh, these appeals will be heard, and I hope that uh, this uh, uh, will end soon and uh, that uh, uh, Ethiopia uh, will be able to find uh, the peace it needs for its development and the well-being of its people. The president of Ethiopia has given the Tigrayan forces 72 hours starting Sunday night uh, to surrender or they're going to bomb the largest city in Tigray, which is about 500,000 people. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that all these people are fleeing if they do end up shelling that city, having been shelled myself just in the last few weeks in Stepanakert in, in Armenia, I can tell you that's not a, that's not a fun thing. And uh, that, this is a, a much bigger town. A lot of people that don't have the wherewithal to leave. And so if they start getting bombed, it's going to be carnage. It's going to be really bad. Uh, and they're not really letting journalists in there. They, they have a nasty habit of killing journalists. So there's not a lot of uh, information coming out about what's going on at the moment. But I can tell you it's probably not good. And with the, the president being a Nobel Peace Prize winner, and now he's about to uh, shell a city of 500,000 people, there's some irony in that for sure. So I guess we need to be praying for the people of uh, Ethiopia and of Tigray, the Tigray region uh, especially. Um, the U.S. military has been involved in Ethiopia in trying to counter extremism there by trying to counter poverty and malnourishment. Uh, there's a very interesting story that I did a couple years ago 
about uh, one of those, what they call med caps, uh, 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 that's, uh, where they send U.S. military into a remote region in Ethiopia and basically offer free medical care to people. Uh, and let me just show you the piece, and you, you check this out and tell me what you think. This part of the world has received lots of attention lately because of pirates attacking container ships and taking hostages. But piracy isn't the whole story. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Radical extremism is as much a problem in Africa as it is in Afghanistan. U.S. strategy here is to get the military involved earlier, deny the terrorists a safe haven, and strengthen relations with local governments. We are building their stability, helping them build a better lifestyle, and in the end, that does promote a more stable region and keep extremism at bay. In the past, terror organizations found willing recruits by offering hope in this area crushed by poverty and disease. Now, military doctors simply treating for internal parasites, from which nearly everyone here suffers, can help fight extremism. Some of the physicians here are calling it the global war on worms. Hundreds of people have been showing up to wait in this empty field over the last 24 hours, wanting to be seen by the military physicians that are here for the medical clinic today. For many of these people, it might have been five years or more since the last time they saw a doctor, and it may be another five years before they get this chance again. You can catch more flies with sugar than you can with vinegar. Major Michael Wheeler heads up the mission. His team includes 30 highly skilled personnel from all services, including doctors, dentists, pharmacists, and even a veterinarian. But despite all they have to offer, they don't want the credit. What we want to do is we want to boost the image of the health ministry, local government officials, even the local police. What this does is it gives them a chance to see their government in action and know that their government does care about them and they are working for them. A stronger local government leads to a more stable society, which will hopefully make us all a bit safer in the long run. Scott Regick left the elite special forces for civil affairs because he saw the effectiveness of this unique kind of mission. I think these people realize that we Americans were a compassionate people. After a mission like this, they don't wish us any ill. But as a father of two kids, which I do miss a lot, uh, to see these kids, to put a smile on their face, to know that we're doing good for them, it fills my heart with a lot of joy. Another benefit to this strategy is the cost. Humanitarian aid is one of the cheapest military missions there is. For example, this entire two-week deployment cost about as much as a single tank of fuel for a large military cargo transport. Not only that, but this kind of preemptive strike, stopping terrorism before it takes root, is cheaper where it really counts, in human lives. During their 12-month deployment, this unit didn't lose a single member to enemy fire. As our command develops, we would like to extend this friendship to even more parts of Africa. It's been a great experience to come out here and help these people, uh, to work in conjunction with the Ethiopian government. It's a positive experience for us. It's a positive experience for them. I think we're, this is going to go a long way. Chuck Holton, CBN News, Diridawa, Ethiopia. Okay, so more is likely to happen in Ethiopia. I wish I could get out there, but I'm not going to travel anymore between now and, and the end of the year, I think. I'm going to try and uh, stay home and finish a couple of projects I've got going around here. Uh, so thanks for watching The Hot Zone. I'm going to take Friday off for Thanksgiving, uh, so we'll see you back again next week. Uh, I just want to remind you that uh, I'm working on this project to make a full-length documentary about the crisis in Armenia and Artsakh, uh, the the protectorate there, and uh, it's it's a bad situation. And these are Armenian Christians that are being persecuted for their faith. And so I want to tell that story. So if you'd like to help uh, get behind that project, you can go to givesendgo.com/artsakh, A R T S A K H. Uh, or just look me up on Facebook. I've got a fundraiser going there too. We're trying to raise enough money so I can get back over there, spend a, a good amount of time, so uh, in, probably in the first part of January, uh, and actually uh, tell their story right. Put it all in so that, so that people can't ignore 
what's happening to our Christian brothers and sisters in Armenia. So if you'd like to get behind that, I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching Hot Zone. Like and share it with your friends. We'll see you back again next week. Have a great Thanksgiving. We have a lot to be thankful for, even though it is 2020. <laughs> the Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.